Today on Let the Bible Speak. Today we answer a question from a viewer about tithing. Find out what the Bible says about tithes and whether Christians are expected to tithe today. From the Churches of Christ, Let the Bible Speak with Kevin Presley. It's good to be with you today to study God's Word. I'm Kevin Presley, and this is a Bible study broadcast brought to you by Churches of Christ. We believe the Scriptures are inspired of God and that they are to be the source of our faith and practice and the only authority in the exercise of our faith. Today we'll address a series of questions sent to us by a viewer about tithing. You hear many church leaders and preachers talk about tithing, most of them encouraging their flock to tithe to their local church. But our viewer David asks, does the fact that Abraham and Jacob paid tithes not by commandment but out of their heart mean that it's a requirement for the New Testament church to also pay tithes? And number two, weren't tithes produce as opposed to money? Abraham was wealthy, but he tithed produce instead of silver and gold. And were tithes and offerings different things? And then number three, does the Bible teach that preachers should be given a salary by the church? Well, David, those are good questions, and yes, they do go together. We'll deal with those questions in our Bible study today, including the question, is tithing as taught in the Old Testament for New Testament Christians? Our study in just a moment. If you'd like to dig deeper into the Word of God, I'd like to provide you with a great opportunity to do that, and it's free. I uh, hope to hear from you today enrolling in our Bible Correspondence course. You don't need to feel overwhelmed by the Bible. If you don't know how to study the Bible or where to begin in reading the Bible, this course will help get you on track, and it'll answer some very, very important and fundamental questions about the Bible and what the overall message is about. And uh, when you enroll in the course, we send out the first lesson. You take the time to read through it and answer the questions. You send it back to us. We'll uh, check it and send it back along with the next lesson in the course. You do it in the privacy of your home at your own pace. And again, it is free. So let us hear from you today, and we will enroll you in the Bible Correspondence course. Connect with us on social media. Go to Facebook.com and search for Let the Bible Speak TV. The questions from our viewer David have to do with tithes and offerings as we read about them under the Old Covenant and whether they apply to us today in the New Testament dispensation. Are we required to give them today and how are preachers of the gospel to be financially supported today? Well, to begin with, there was a difference under the Old Testament between tithes and then other various offerings. Let's talk about tithing. In Malachi 3 and verse 8, the Lord said, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me, but ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings, God said. 
Now, God went on to issue a curse upon the people for this crime against heaven. Uh, the word tithe here simply means a tenth, and it refers to the practice of people under the Old Testament giving a tenth of their property to God and His work. And it was a very serious thing under the law not to do that. Now, we actually first read about people voluntarily tithing before the law of Moses was ever given. In fact, the first instance recorded in Scripture is found in Genesis 14 when Abram returned from that battle against those kings who were holding his nephew Lot captive, you may recall. He won the battle, returned with the spoils of victory, and the Bible says he praised God for winning the battle, and he gave him tithes of all, Genesis 14 and verse 20. That is, he gave a tenth of the spoils to the king of Salem, Melchizedek. And then we read of a similar incident in the life of Abram's grandson, Jacob, over in Genesis chapter 28. You may recall when he spent the night at Haran, making himself a pallet out of stones. He had that famous dream that we call Jacob's ladder. And he saw a ladder let down out of heaven with angels climbing up and down the ladder. And the Lord spoke from heaven and confirmed the Abrahamic covenant to Jacob that he would possess the land where he was sleeping and that his numerous descendants would be favored and protected by God. When Jacob awoke from that dream in amazement, the Bible says that he vowed to be faithful to God. And in verse 22, he said, And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house, and of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. So he too promised to give God a tithe or tenth of his property in response to God's blessing him. Now, both of these instances, as far as we can tell from Scripture, were voluntary. There is no record of where either man was commanded by God to tithe, but rather this was simply their own response to God's goodness and provision in their lives. But now, hundreds of years later, when the law of Moses was given to the Israelites, it became a different matter. We don't find any command in the Bible to tithe under the patriarchal age, but we do when we get to Leviticus chapter 27 and when the law was in effect. And in verses 30 through 32, the Lord there said, And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. And if a man will at all redeem aught of his tithes, he shall add thereto the fifth part thereof. And concerning the tithe of the herd or the flock, even whatsoever passeth under the rod, the tenth or tithe shall be holy unto the Lord. Now under the law, God required tithes of His people in addition to various offerings that they were commanded to give at certain times. Now there were actually three different tithes imposed upon the Hebrews, and all three of them consisted of a tenth portion of their crops and animals. There was uh, number one, the Levitical tithe, and that tithe was collected for the tribe of Levi to support the priests. We read about that over in Numbers chapter 18, verses 21 to 24. And then number two, there was the festive tithe that was to be saved back and eaten by the giver of the tithe along with his household and along with the Levites. And then number three, there was a tithe given every three years for the poor. Now all of these tithes consisted of food. And apart from this third tithe, all of the tithes had to be taken to Jerusalem and offered, and the tithes were stored there in the temple. Now this was not like a collection of money. They actually brought a tenth of the fruit of the land and of their herds to Jerusalem, and it was given to the priests. Now, like other aspects of the law, the people weren't always consistent to obey the commandment to tithe, and the spiritual state of the nation was sometimes reflected by whether or not they were tithing like the law required. During the reforms of Hezekiah that are outlined in 2 Chronicles chapter 31, the king ordered the people to begin tithing again so that the priests and Levites could devote themselves to the work of the Lord. They were once again commanded to come to Jerusalem in order to offer their tithe. So tithing was, again, not a collection that was taken up in various places. It was given at a specific time in a specific place in Jerusalem at the site of the temple. Now when the monarchy was established, the Israelites had to give another tenth to support their new government according to 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 15 through 17. 
Uh, the Jews were also to leave their land idle one year out of every seven, and they were to forgive all their debts every 50 years during what was called the year of Jubilee. Uh, they were also to leave the corners of their fields for the poor to come and glean from them. And besides all of that, they regularly offered their livestock for special sacrifices ordered under the law. So it wasn't just tithing. When you add up what the Israelites were required to give at various times, you can figure as much as half of everything that belonged to a faithful Jew ended up in one way or another being returned to God. So what does that mean for us today? Are all of those laws applicable to the Christian? Specifically, what about tithing? Well, surely we can see that offerings for the purpose of all of the sacrifices often offered under the law, they have no literal application to us today. We don't offer animal sacrifices to the Lord. Jesus is our sacrifice. But still yet, what about tithing? Well, contrary to what many preachers want you to believe today, there is no commandment in the New Testament for Christians to tithe. Tithing before the law of Moses was voluntary, and the law that later commanded tithing was nailed to the cross and taken out of the way. Colossians chapter 2 verse 14 says, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to His cross. Uh, Romans 3 and verse 28, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Also, if tithing as commanded under the Old Testament is binding upon Christians today, which of the three tithes are we to offer? Why wouldn't the procedures and stipulations of the Levitical tithe, for example, be required of us as well, such as farmers bringing their produce and livestock to Jerusalem to offer to priests? But you see, there is no temple in Jerusalem and there are no Levitical priests. That was all done away in Christ. Now, there are several objections that are usually raised, including this one, which comes from Hebrews chapter 7. And there, the Hebrew writer makes reference to Abram paying tithes to Melchizedek when he returned, uh, when he returned from war. And in verse 4 there, the Bible says, Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. And so it's argued that Abraham here is presented as a type of the Christian today, and Melchizedek is a type of Jesus Christ, our King and our High Priest. And so the Hebrew writer is showing us, supposedly, that Christians should give tithes to Jesus today, just as Abram tithed to Melchizedek. But that's not the point the writer is making at all. He wasn't proving that Christians are required to tithe, because the tithe that Abram gave to Melchizedek was voluntary. But now then one may say, but Abram's tithe was given before the law of Moses, and so that would mean that tithing transcends the Mosaic law and applies to believers in every age. Well, again, Abram's tithe was first of all voluntary. But not only that, the law of Christ that we have in the New Testament includes many of the same principles and commands as were in place in former dispensations. They're restated by Christ and His apostles, and therefore they become a part of His law. But yet there is no commandment or example of New Testament Christians tithing or being told to tithe to the church or preachers or anybody else. Oh, but one may say, what about Matthew 23 verse 23? And that's where Jesus condemned the scribes and Pharisees and called them hypocrites. He said, For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. You see, they were paying tithes in Jesus' day. And Jesus is saying, You should pay tithes, plus you should attend primarily to the weightier matters, uh, or first to the weightier matters of the law. Well, yes, they were paying tithes, and Jesus did commend them paying tithes, but they were also Pharisees making an attempt to keep the law of Moses, and they were still living under the, that dispensation. They were not living under the new covenant. That didn't go into effect until Christ died. But then what about Matthew chapter 5 and verse 20, where Jesus said, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. 
So some argue that since the Pharisees tithe, that we're required to tithe and then some if we want to be saved. But now that's a gross misunderstanding and misapplication of this particular text. Surely Jesus is not saying that unless we are more successful at keeping the law of Moses than the Pharisees were, then we cannot be saved. The Bible teaches that we're not to keep the law of Moses. We've been freed from that law. Because again, Paul said, by the keeping of the law, no flesh will be justified, Romans 3 and verse 20. Now the Pharisees were trying to justify themselves through their own standard of so-called righteousness. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 3, Paul later spoke of how the Jews being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Now the fact is the righteousness of the Pharisees was a self-righteousness and their attempt at self-justification. Jesus, you see, brought a different system of righteousness into the world and that's God's system of justification through the gospel. And without that kind of righteousness, no person can enter into the kingdom. Now that's really the point of what Jesus was saying in the Sermon on the Mount. And then some will say, but God blesses those who tithe and He curses those who don't, according to Malachi the third chapter. Well, let's go back to that text, verses 8 through 10. If you read those verses, God says to put him to the test. And if you bring tithes to the temple, he will open the windows of heaven and give more than we have room for. But he says we are cursed if we rob God of his tithes. But friend, the context clearly shows that God is dealing with the sins of the Jews as a nation here. Look at it in verse 9. He says, Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me even this whole nation. What nation? Well, the Jews, Israel. He says in verse 10, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. Now that's a reference to the temple and the place built there to store their tithes of grain and produce and so forth. And the rest of the context shows the same thing. So Christians today are not cursed for not tithing. Uh, this uh, particular warning and admonition given in the book of Malachi was written unto uh, wayward Jews, God's people who were failing to keep the, co the covenant with God. But now, don't get the idea. Don't get the idea that this lets Christians off the hook. To say that Christians are not expected to tithe is not the same thing as saying that Christians are not expected to give. God does not include tithing in the new covenant, but He did in a similar manner provide for the work of His kingdom to be funded by the generous giving of members of His church. There is one and only one requirement outlined in the New Testament concerning how and when Christians are to give to the work of the kingdom. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verses 1 and 2, Paul there wrote, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. Now, there were needs that arose among the churches from time to time due to famines and so forth. In this case, the poor saints in Jerusalem were in great distress. And Paul orders the churches to come to the aid of these faithful members at Jerusalem by sending money from their treasury that they had saved up, sending money from that to them. Now, how was this treasury built up and maintained? He said upon the first day of the week, each one, each Christian, was to set aside a portion of his income and it was to be treasured up by each local church so that it would be ready and available so that no gatherings would have to take place at the time of need. He's saying more than just set aside a little money in your home and have it ready. He says you lay by in store and you do in such a way that there are no gatherings when Paul came there. And so that tells us that the church kept a treasury of these offerings that their members brought upon the first day of the week. Now just as the churches used this treasury to aid destitute saints, they also as congregations supported those who dedicated themselves to the ministry. Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 15, Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from uh, Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. In other words, Paul took wages from them. He took 
uh, financial assistance from them in his work in the gospel. He took wages from various churches to support him while he was working among the church at Corinth, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 8, where he said, I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. Uh, he said over in 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, down beginning in verse 13, Do ye not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? Now there he's referring to the system that God had under the old covenant. He said, And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. Even so hath the Lord ordained. Now there's a difference. He said, Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. In other words, as the tithe supported the Levitical priests, so the offering that Christians give on Sunday, that's used to support those who preach the gospel. But now the latter is not the same as the former. And you'll find the difference in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning in the 6th verse. Here Paul says, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Verse 7, Every man according as he hath purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. In other words, this offering is to be given by Christians, uh, and it's not a compulsory amount like the tithe. It is as the believer purposes in his heart. He is to give liberally and cheerfully, not by compulsion. Now while I don't believe tithing is in any way a part of the New Testament church, giving every first day of the week certainly is. And it's hard for me to imagine that if the Jew who lived under law gave up to half of his income in compulsory tithes and offerings, that a Christian benefited by the grace of God shown in Jesus Christ can just throw a few dollars in the plate that require no sacrifice and no real forethought and planning and say that he has offered God and shown proper zeal and concern for the kingdom of God. We need to be generous with what God has blessed us with. We need to sow things of the Spirit as opposed to things of the flesh. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 8 if we want to reap accordingly. Can you imagine how the kingdom of God could advance if every member of every local church gave the first portion of his or her income back to God's service? Now, with that said, I want to point this out. In over 20 years of preaching on television, I have never appealed to a single viewer of this broadcast to give one dime to me, to the broadcast, or to the church I represent, and I never will. We are not interested in your money, dear friend. We're interested in your soul. Now, if you are a Christian, a member of Christ's church, where you need to be giving is not to television ministries, quote unquote. You need to be giving to your local church every first day of the week because that is the Lord's way for providing for the needs of His work. This broadcast is paid for in full by the local church and not our viewers because that's the scriptural way of funding the Lord's work. We don't hold rummage sales, bake sales, cake walks, and all manner of other fundraisers because that's not what the Lord told us to do. We support the work of each local church by each church taking a collection on Sunday from its own members to be used in the work that God has prescribed for the local church to carry out. And that's the Lord's simple plan. Upon the first day of the week, lay by in store and do so as each one purposes in his heart. Do it liberally, do it cheerfully. That's God's plan for giving in this age of time.
Apostle Paul saw the gospel as a sacred trust, saying in 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 5 that he didn't use flattering words nor a cloak of covetousness. But yet preachers week after week come into our living rooms with their handout. We don't expect you to fund our ministry or to pay to hear the gospel. Therefore, let the Bible speak is different. This program is brought to you by a local congregation of the Church of Christ in your community who simply want to reach out and spread the truth of New Testament Christianity. We thank you for watching Let the Bible Speak, and we hope that you'll tell someone else about this program and encourage them to see the difference. Want to see today's study again? Watch Let the Bible Speak anytime, even on the go, on your computer, tablet, or smartphone. Go to LetTheBibleSpeak.tv and also connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Thanks for those good questions, David, and I hope that our answers from the Word of God have given you some insight into the subject. If you have a question you would like for us to answer here on Let the Bible Speak, we'll be happy to try to get to that. Just email me at kevin at letthebiblespeak.tv and uh, we will try to, again, get to that in a future broadcast. If you would like a transcript of what we've studied today, simply get in touch with us and request the lesson, Is Tithing for Today? and we'll have that on its way. It is free of any cost whatsoever. You can also subscribe to our podcast and listen to the program on the go. We're on social media and our website, letthebiblespeak.tv. Appreciate you joining me today. I hope you'll make plans, if the Lord wills, to join me back here next time for another study of God's Word. In the meantime, I hope you'll visit a congregation of the Church of Christ near you. Plan to see me back here next time for another study. Until then, may the Lord bless you. Bible Speak is brought to you by your friends in the Churches of Christ.